people that don't know what the double wing is and why you switched to it, do you want to explain that real quick? Just so yeah, you know, I think that's a fantastic question because I, I think that I think that many people the first time they maybe come across it look at it and go, "What the heck is this?" And uh, they look at it and think, "Why would anyone do this?" And then eventually they may find themselves running it. Um, you know, the, the offensive football, it, 101 in our world is go forward. And honestly, since 1997 or so, when I was playing college football, I remember having that philosophy of, hey, offenses that go forward are better than ones that don't, which obviously that's a pretty simplistic thought process of football. But I was a center, so what else <laughs> thought process would I have, right? Um, and the double wing is, a, you know, a system that obviously emphasizes that. Um, it's a reduced split offense. And part of the advantage of the reduced split is that you're trying to create maximum power in every movement. So one of the ways I explain this to guys is the more horizontal spacing that you have, and it doesn't matter if you're two by two or if you're a zone based scheme, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the offense or or wing T a dive based scheme, the more spacing that you create uh, horizontally with your splits of your players, splits of receivers and whatnot, the less potential power as far as vertical movement and get off you can create. And that should make uh, sense to most folks because the more space I have between me, the more it becomes about control than it is about vertical movement or creating maximum synergy off the ball, body movement off the ball to create uh, movement of a defender. So by us being a reduced split offense, that I guess that's kind of quintessential point number one is we're a reduced split offense. And the purpose in that is to create maximal vertical movement, create maximum power, be able to get off the ball vertically as fast as we can. Now that's not to say other offenses can't have spacing and power. I mean, all the, the armed forces play great flex bone football. They're power based offenses with big horizontal split spacing. However, the difference is their power is being generated by their level two blocks and the, the pace and, and, uh, and effort that their fullbacks and dive games hitting the line of scrimmage. It's not being based on how much vertical movement they can create with their offense line. Um, so that, I think that's number one. Number two is by being a wing-based offense, just like the wing T or the flux bone, is we are, we're trying to create a conflict of either outflanking the, the defense or having a defense outflank us. And if the defense is going to outflank us, that gives us one more gap that we can potentially hit vertically. And if the defense is going to allow us to outflank the, them, obviously we have great sweep potential, just like those other offenses do. So that's another kind of key component of it. And probably the thing that makes it unique to maybe the wing tee or the flex bone is the whole system's based off the power off tackle play. And, um, you know, we, uh, we've been running power off tackle in in every offense that we've ever ran. We've been running double wing for about 20 years now, but even prior to that power off tackle was our base play. And really that's how we evolved to the double wing was this concept of wanting to be able to run speed sweep and stretch people horizontally while also having a great power off a tackle play. And and, and I think that, you know, there's, there's few ways to do that in football uh, outside uh, this type of system. Okay. And then uh, my next question is, what do you think is the biggest misconception with the double wing offense? I mean, there's a lot of, you'll never play receiver. You'll never do this. You'll never do that. What do you think is the biggest misconception with this offense? Yeah. I mean, I think the big thing is how multiple it can be. Uh, and different people have different philosophies for, for 10 years, we were a double tight, double wing. Don't break it. Find your, your next best offensive tackle and play them at tight end. Uh, philosophy as a team and we were we wanted to run off tackle and stubbornly we wanted to run off tackle and and that all changed um in 2010 2009 and we decided that we were going to start running some different formational looks and then in 2011 when we were at St. Heights we had a great opportunity to experiment with those formational looks um and in that process uh, we found out this was this could be a very multi-formational attack, and it could be one that utilizes different personnel. We're still working on that. Uh, since 2011, we've been working on how do we continue to modify to utilize our personnel the best um, in a way that still allows us to have our speed sweep game and power off tackle and play action game with four potential for receivers at line of scrimmage um, and, uh, and, and be based in our system. 
which obviously has reduced splits and those types of things. So uh, when we talk about it as a, as a staff and we're working on our system and trying to improve ourselves, we're never talking about this, hey, we're double tight, double wing. We need to pound it forward for three yards and run power 72 times tonight. We talk about how we're a three-man surface reduced split team. We talk about how we want to have four receivers that can attack the passing zones as quickly as possible. We talk about how we want to be able to be an effective power off tackle team. And we talk about how we've got to be able to run speed sweep. And, and that's really the basis of what we're doing. So. Okay. Um, do you, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, so I'll just ask this. Do you flip your offensive line? Yeah, we haven't. Uh, it's something actually we're looking at doing this coming year. If we have a 2020 season, we are planning on flipping our offensive line. So here, here's my thought with that. If if you're going to be a 70% mm, balanced team, so you and if you're a balanced team 70% of the time, that means you're going to be running your power game both ways pretty equally. You're going to be running your trap game both ways pretty equally. I don't think there's merit to flipping your line then because at that point you need to be able to run those base power counter sweep schemes that are the you know foundation of the offense you got to be able to run those to both sides of the formation so ultimately it doesn't benefit your team to have your your lineman flip when both of them have to know how to run power anyhow and both of them have to run counter in my opinion now with that said we've typically had a strong side and a weak side of our line uh, we've had or a quick side of our line i should say um now we're looking at being formationally a little more unbalanced next year. We're looking at more closer to like 10 to 20% that we're going to be unbalanced. When I say unbalanced, I don't mean an unbalanced line. I mean a uh, structure of a three to four man surface on one side and a two to three man surface on the other side. And by our line not being balanced to both sides, I think there's a lot of merit to be flipping like the wing T guys do, because that's, that's their reality. You're going to run specific plays and certain plays to either side of the line. So why not cut your practice time in half to maximize that? So I think that ties more directly to um, your foundational alignment uh, focus and goals more so than necessarily, uh, you know, what offense you run. Okay. So what, you actually just gave me a great idea for a question. Um, in terms of practice time, how, how, how do you typically structure early practices to, I mean, obviously you've been at your school long enough to, um, to where a lot of your kids year to year know what you're doing, know your system, but how do you typically structure your practices, especially like early summer, um, getting in two days and stuff to install your offense? Like what do your periods look like? What yep. was, what, what does that process look like? Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll show you a script here of exactly what we do. Um, I, I know I recently had up a, a script here of day one practice. So let me see if I can find that. Um, so f first off for us, in the, it starts in the summer. And in the summertime uh, in Michigan, you're allowed to work with seven players at a time. We spend a lot of time um, during that working on blocking fundamentals, you know, pass game, obviously all the same stuff probably most people are working on. But we have a progression that we go through in our seven-man workouts with our offensive linemen throughout the summer um, that is foundational skills, uh, which we believe is probably the most important uh, part of the initial teaching. When I've gone to a new school, which I've done a few times, uh, what we've done with that is eight two-hour sessions and we ran them at camps. And it's all just blocking fundamentals, blocking 101 type stuff. And, and it's nothing, it's nothing earth shattering. It's a two hour clinic in itself. Uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's getting kids to bend their ankles, knees and hips. It's teaching kids the concept of leverage. It's teaching kids how to extend their hips. It's teaching kids blocking service, which we're both a hand in shoulder blocking surface team. So teaching that technique, teaching kids how to then finish and, and get proper footwork into their finish. So. That's the starting point. And then we go into our installation, um, our installation stuff. And our installation stuff is, is built around, obviously, our play installation and practices. This is, from, this is from 17, but this is day one, practice one from 2017. And we started it with a wedge drill and doing team wedge. And then uh, in that, we had three periods of individual once we get through our blocking pro uh, progression stuff, there are three main drills that we do every single day with our linemen. 
and it's our six point drill. It's our shoot drill, which is also a board drill. And then it's a sled, uh, two man Ray Crowther sled. And we really, really believe in the two man Crowther sled. Bob McKittrick has a video from the early nineties, uh, San Francisco 49ers with the Ray Crowther sled. It's like an instructional video of the Crowther sled. It's an awesome, awesome video. That's the progression we use. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, we saw it about eight years ago. And I, I would recommend anybody who's watching this to go to the Bob McKittrick uh, uh, Ray Crowther sled YouTube video. I think that's what you have to type in is Ray Crowther sled Bob McKittrick to find it on YouTube. But uh, it's like a three part right cut out of the 1970s, you know, high coaching shorts with double buttons. It's perfect. It's a beautiful thing. And then we do either a double team drill or a six point drill every every single day. Uh, after that, we go into our group drills, our main group drills that we do, our trap drill, which we always do with group pass. And then we do a perimeter run drill and we do an inside run drill. We do at least two of those every single day. Um, and then we go into our team drill. And, and group pass trap drill is just about every single day. So that, that's what our basic uh, instructional series looks like. And we, we follow that just about every day all year long. And, and you'll know, you know, on this script, so this is day one, there's 12 periods of offense and that's about where we're at. And, and like all coaches, I never run over, uh, of course that's <laughs> chasm. Uh, but you know, we try to, we try to keep it within that reasonable 12 periods. Now, now I have to ask, cause I see at the top, it says team wedge. And I am probably after my two years of working for Derek Catris, one of the biggest fans of wedge in human history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what does team wedge look like? I'm either now, now I'm curious. Yeah, so what we do is we'll take uh, our center and, uh, you know, the, the left guard, for example, and we'll work on just their wedge fit. So for us, we teach it with the hand going right above the buttocks and the small of the back and the shoulder. So if it's left guard, his right shoulder would go uh, in the center's buttocks. And then the left hand comes in and touches the side of the thigh of the center. So we just take the one step with the center and guard, and then we'll bring in the right guard and they'll take the one step and they, they form a V uh, with both hands going to the small of the back, both hands come to the side and stay square. Then we'll bring in the tackle, do the same thing with him. He'll work obviously the guards uh, backside, putting his hand on the small of the back and staying square. He typically has to take one and a half steps to get that same alignment. And then we'll bring in the tight ends and they'll do the same thing. And then after that, we'll put a defender, and it's usually me, it's usually one of our coaches, right over the center. Because what the center wants to do on wedge often is, is take off. He'll want to run out. And he can't do that. He has to, he has to be able to, to just hold his position, creating elevation on the nose tackle. That's his only objective is try to create vertical lift of the torso of the nose tackle. And if he can create vertical lift of the torso of the nose tackle, the push and the power actually comes from the players behind. Most wedges that get destroyed because of offensive issues and not defensive issues, of course, is because the momentum of the offensive lineman is working this way rather than working this way. So the, the initial goal of this is to get all of our players to get their momentum square to the line of scrimmage as they're working horizontally, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to try to create vertical push on the center. Well, if the center takes off, he just runs out of there. As we're working horizontally together square, he's gone by the time we get to our alignment. So it's critical that the center just works to get vertical lift. And we do a, a double underhook technique on that. Try to get lift of the torso. And then we bring the defenders behind creating vertical movement. Um, so when you, when you install in the summer, do you do everything just straight on the field? Or do you have classroom time where you draw stuff on the board, you show film, et cetera? So before uh, when we get into the regular season in our regular practices, before we go out to the practice field, we practice three hours a day. That's it. So I, I would say we're pro pretty minimal as far as on the field time. We do spend an hour in film uh, each day uh, prior to the start of practice. And we review the practice film from the day prior and we alternate between offensive and defensive film. So one day we'll show offensive film, the next day we'll show defensive film uh, for that whole hour. So we invest a lot of time and focus on the one side of the ball. Um, and we will hit a little bit of special teams in most of those as well. Okay. Um, Personnel-wise, what, 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 what are you – I mean, everybody's got a different priority. Like I listened to, I, to Bob Jesowich, Dublin, 
Jerome Talk, his biggest priority is finding five offensive linemen, a quarterback, and then he just puts the next best five on the field somewhere. What is your priority when you're putting together your personnel? Like, what is your priority? Yeah, you know, I think that's a huge question. Um, And I think that's – actually, Nick, that's a great question because I think that's something that I didn't really start thinking about until, you know, maybe year 11 or 12 as a head coach. Uh, and now I, I going to year 20 ish here, it's like, the, that's a priority, you know, like that's, that's number one thing we start looking at. Um, so to, to start out the, to answer the question in a way that you're probably not looking for is defense. We, we start looking at our defense. We want our program to be defensive minded. Uh, we believe that, you know, you know, the whole defense wins champions thing. Yeah. Everyone has some, some belief in that regardless of how good these offenses are, there's still the teams with best defense are winning the national championships and big championships. But there's another piece to that that I think really matters. It's the type of mindset that you want your school and your program. So if everything that you do in your program is based around uh, Johnny Smith, the the star quarterback, or Johnny Smith, the star receiver, and your culture within your programs are built around those types of guys – I think it's very, very, very difficult to, to build a consistent program that wins year in, year out. Ultimately, you have to have guys that are really unselfish. You have to have guys that are that are team committed. You have to have guys that are, are willing to work hard. You have to have guys that are physical, regardless of the schemes that you run, offensively or defensively. And when you're a defensive-minded program, all of those things are defense. Those are, that, those are the foundational roots of defense is being unselfish, being willing to hit, uh, I, I, you know, putting the other guy in front of you, that type of thing. So we start there. Uh, with that said, offensively, we want to find seven offensive linemen. So we, we want to identify who our top seven guys are. And as quick as we can find those seven guys, uh, we're going to have most likely it's, it's three guards, three tackles, a center, and one of those guards and tackles uh, can also play the center position. Uh, we get them rotating in there and getting maximum reps because we're a big believer that the synergy that it takes to run this offense in particular requires an ample amount of reps with guys that you're comfortable with. Um, we will have three tight ends. Oftentimes the third one uh, will be a kid who might play some fullback or wing or another position as well. Many times we've had a kid that's like a true wide receiver. That's that third uh, kid or that rotates in there as well. Um, so, but three, three ends for sure. Uh, obviously you need a quarterback and a backup quarterback. And then the backfield, we always are working for three wing backs and two full backs. And again, a lot of times there's a crossover there. So ultimately then we're looking for about 16 guys, uh, that can get ample reps, uh, that are ready to play. And, and from a personnel standpoint, we, we look for our super tackle first, which is our right offensive tackle. He's our most, uh, consistent drive blocker. We call him our earth mover type kid. Um, so we have to find that, uh, we have to find our quarterback. We prefer dual threat kids. We, we don't care at all about height. Uh, length doesn't matter to us at all. In fact, the best ones we've had have been, uh, kind of undersized quick kids. And then, um, finding a fullback, finding that guy who's going to be a, a consistent, tough kid in there, uh, is a huge priority for every year for us offense. All right. Um, offense, offensively. I mean, I, I think we all all that know the double wing know superpower is probably the play. Um, but I know you're also very fullback oriented where some teams are a little more wing oriented. Um, what, in, in your opinion, what, what is your order of ne- necessary pl- – like if you're year one um, double wing, double tight double wing, what are, yeah. your, what are like the three to five plays that have to be installed in your opinion? Yeah, so play one going in is power. Well, obviously, that wedge drill we're going to do day one, first drill. And to be honest with you, that wedge drill, we, that team wedge, we do it in that one drill. We don't do it again all year long. Um, we'll wrap wedge the last play of practice every single day, one time, and that's it. That's all okay. the love that gets. And, and it's been an effective play for us because the initial teaching of it is so deliberate uh, and let's face it, running a wedge isn't rocket science, right? It's a it's a low maintenance install. So once you get your guys to understand how to run it, you, you, you're you're good. You don't need a thousand reps at it. Uh, power obviously is a play that is a high maintenance play. Our belief in power is that we want that play to be able to hit anywhere from A to D gap. It's almost like a zone concept to us. In the standpoint of it can hit multiple gaps. 
And, and because of that, we're talking about a reactionary play versus uh, just a, a standard down and kick play. I think a lot of people in, in our offense, including uh, run as a pure down and kick play uh, in, in their thought process is they're going to hammer in C gap or D gap, no matter what for us, uh, there's a lot more reactionary. So if, if we're double teaming an A technique, for example, and that A, a technique widens out because they know that when our tight end blocks and we run a lot of sweep, we're going to funnel that play back up to C or B gap, then we're going to cut it back. So because of that, uh, it, it takes a lot more reaction movement drills for our pullers to see, react to what the stimulus in front of them is doing, and then adjust off of it. Uh, so that's a play that we're never done teaching. Counter goes in right after that. Counter is power away from the motion. So when we teach counter, it's the same thing as power. Obviously, there's some, some minutia that's different, but the reality is it's just it's power away from the motion. So it's, it's essentially the same play, and we rep it as, as if it's that. And then our speed sweep, which we've ran rocket and jet through the years. Um, we've had success with both. Uh, both are great schemes. Uh, and then both are both take a lot of repetition. Both You're going to get a lot of different edge looks. You have to be able to block every edge look. You're going to want to alter your edge look and how you're, you're attacking them. So that takes a lot of repetition just because of, of all the different looks that you're going to both see from the defense and the looks that you want to give the defense to create conflict on the edge with the speed sweep. So uh, that's the base. Then after that, the G series is probably the next thing that goes in. Uh, the reason that is, is so anytime, you know, one of the foundational beliefs in, in the double wing is creating this vertical movement and knocking people off the football. Well, when people start burying on you and diving on you and doing all these other tactics with you, uh, it, it's difficult to do that. And, and the reason that is, is because our goal is to knock people vertically off the ball and then run the circle with our pullers and, and allow our pullers to bend forward. Well, the minute that you're not knocking people off the ball, your pullers would have to run more lateral lateral, and then vertical, and you lose the potential power that you create when you're able to knock people off the ball and run the circle. So the G play to us, we call we just say it's fullback power. It's power play to the fullback. Now, that doesn't require us to create any movement on the line of scrimmage. I mean, it's the wing T down play. So our objective here is to cover people up rather than create vertical movement. Well, that's a nice compliment to our power play because, again, we're not, we're not required to do that vertical movement. We don't have to run the circle. We just have to be able to stay square, get vertical, and we can still run the power play. The other piece that ties to it, it's an easy install. If your kids know how to run power, they know how to run G. The, the two plays are, are essentially the same. It's just a down block scheme versus a double team scheme. Um, and then after that, the trap scheme. Uh, the trap screen is scheme is a critical scheme, especially even fronts. Um, and when I say trap scheme, we're, we're probably 80% wide trap, trap influence. We don't run a ton of tight trap uh, just because of the condensed spacing and splits. Uh, but we will, obviously, if, if we've got a three-tech that's fair to handle. But the trap scheme is a complement to the power scheme. Whoever you are double-teaming on your power is who you should be trapping on your trap scheme. And when you start having difficulty getting movement on those double-teams, your first response as an offense should be to trap that guy that you can't double-team. Because why can't you double-team? Because he's playing vertical back against you, and therefore is highly trappable. So that, just a simple perspective that probably most guys that have ran this offense already know, but at the same time, I, I don't think it hurts to say again, uh, you know, that trap scheme and the complement piece to power, some games you won't run at all. And typically those games are having success running power, but those games where it's gets sticky running power, uh, running a trap scheme against those guys who are making it sticky is a pretty critical component. Uh, pa pass game wise. Cause I, I mean, that's, that's always the, I think when I listen to people talk double wing, is that's always the critical aspect is you can't throw the ball. What happens when you do so and so? And so what path, I'm not going to say concepts. Do you, do you find naked boot? Like what, what, what typically is like one of the better routes to go to help implement a good pass scheme or um, help, I don't know. Defend your run game is what I mean, because it really in, our, in in the double wing, your pass game more defends your run game to help preventing the overloading of the box and the other variety of issues that could show up. 
Yeah, I'm going to share my screen here uh, to answer that as well. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I think there's there's quite a few things that you can do, but it, again, it, it's about creating conflict for the defense. And um, so, first off, when you're talking about structure and you're talking about pass game within that structure, uh, you got a two high or you got a one high defense, regardless of of what their coverage is, maybe you get a full man too that looks a little bit different. But typically when you see a full man, it's going to look like a two high two. And so anytime we see a two high, we know a couple things is happening. If we're double tight, double wing, most likely we're going to see an invert player and it ends up in some type of, uh, of cover three uh, in hindsight. If that's the case, the, the weak side flats become really, really vulnerable. The other thing that uh, we may see off of it is a double invert type scheme where, where both safeties are being coached to stay home and maybe cross key the opposite wing, um, in which case the deep middle is very, very vulnerable. And also any three man flood that we can run on the immediate becomes an immediate threat that's, that's very difficult for them to defend. So in other words, if we went flat motion and ended up in a trip set, it creates some type of movement from the secondary to have to defend. So that just conceptually, that's kind of the first thing that we start talking about. Also, we know that receivers create a change on these structures. So if we did, did see a cover three team, let's say, uh, I, I'm not gonna relabel these players for, the, for this example, but let's say we were just seeing a cover three team like this. As soon as it, we, we go into, let's say an empty set or we remove a receiver here, typically you're gonna see a bump of this corner and you're going to see a bump of this safety, essentially building it back into a too high structure. Even though it may be still a cover three defense, the reality is it typically doesn't play like a cover three or true cover two for us because of their, the run responsibility of those, those uh, safeties and their action that they have to play at. So just, just to start with, that's, those are the things that we, we identify first is what the structure is and then regardless of where the structure is and how they're playing, we want to attack that in an area where it's weak. So I'll give you a, a play example and how we do that as well. Uh, if that will support answering the question here a little bit more detail, bear with me here while I flip on a slide. So one of the first concepts we teach is our pop pass. And when we teach our pop pass for the first time, um, it is always, let's see if I can blow this up for you. There we go. Um, it, it is always out of flex, our flex formation where we have two displaced. And just, and, I, and I'm going to show you this more to show the instructional structures that we use for all of our pass game than necessarily to uh, try to sell this particular play on you. But we'll run this out of double tight. We'll run this out of tight. This is a universal play for us. But in our initial teaching, we always teach it out of flex. Um, when we run it out of flex, this is what we teach our quarterback. We teach our quarterback that is, there's one safety in the middle of the field. We want to run our pop. And on the pop concept, we want our wing back to attack the outside linebacker, whoever the overhang is, whoever the contained defender is. We want to attack him with it, with our eyes and our body and our soul like we're going to block that player. And when we attack that player and that player sees our eyes and sees our body position, he's got to attack and honor or sweep play, which allows us to plant and get vertical right off of it. We want to attack that window, that vertical window, right behind that linebacker um, anytime we have one high. If we have two high defenders, we've got two safeties, we then look, are the corners soft or are they press? If the corners are press, likely they are playing our run support. They're pr the primary run support players, which case we generally want to run some type of crack scheme on our, on our sweep stop. However, it, with, when it comes to the pass game, we run a fade to number one on this side. And our quarterback, again, will reverse pivot. He'll see the press corner. He'll see the safety over the tack. We're going to occupy the safety with the pop scheme. And then we're looking to throw the window to the number one fade uh, outside of that. Again, this corner is, is typically looking at our wing. We're staring in the backfield. 
and is maybe a little slow to reach that fade. We also use the, the rocket sweep action uh, pathway is our is a swing route off of that. So if, if we see the fades real cloudy and don't want to mess with it, we'll pop it out to the uh, the rocket uh, swing route as a, as a safety valve. And then if we have too soft, if both corners are soft, and we got it too high over the top, uh, about 99.9% .9 of the time, then we're going to see some type of invert. And when we see that type of invert to motion, we want to hit the, the seam on the backside. So we'll run what, our quick slant route, which is a vertical seam route for us. Um, he drives hard uh, vertically for three, and then he works into the seam on the slant. Uh, we'll look to throw on the backside. We tag that with a throwback. So too soft. Uh, you know, again, we've had a quarterback be able to read that in the past, but typically we'll, we'll call it from the sideline that uh, we know we're going to get invert and we want to throw that window, that seam on the backside. Obviously, we get a nosy safety out of one high. That can be a good one as well. So that, that's just one concept that we run. Um, then we'll, we'll, from flex, we'll bring in the tight ends and, and reduce their split and we'll put them in a tight slot and we'll teach the same concept out of a tight slot, which for us is pop skinny. So this is the exact same concept for us uh, that we're teaching our kids, but it's just out of a tight slot formation rather than a flex formation. And obviously the routes alter some here. We run, we run a wheel route off of this. It's the same concept as the pop though. He's, he's, he's attacking like he's reaching the overhang and then he's working vertical off of that. We're running a skinny at the one high or we're running a skinny inside of the two high and then a corner out on the backside. If we get a one high defender, we get a one high defender, we throw the wheel to the throwback. The throwback is always our throwaway ball on this. So if we call skinny and the skinny is going to be cloudy because the safety's standing there, then we're going to look wheel to throwback. Um, and that's the throwaway ball. If there's nothing there, we throw it away there. So this, again, basic concept, uh, not getting too detailed into it, but uh, I think giving a decent overview of how, how we are looking to attack the pass play. And then we have six base concepts that we use and all six concepts are kind of built in that same structure. Okay. Um, since, uh, obviously, since I saw there was a playbook there, do you give your kids a either a hard copy or like a Google Drive version of, the, of a playbook or are you like some coaches where they need to take notes, do it on their own? How, what is your view on that? How, how do you handle those situations? Yeah, you know, I never have. Um, and the reason I never have is I, every year, I think, you know, we all have those kids that come up to us and say, coach, can I see the playbook? And, they, and the, the kid who asks that is usually a really passionate kid who cares greatly about football, but maybe easily confused. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the detail and notes in that playbook. So that playbook's 20 years old. It's been involved and adapted every year. I mean, when I go into Google, what is that Google slides? And I hit copy and paste for the next year. And then when I hit copy and paste the next year, I start on the first slide and I start modifying on the things that we are doing differently now that we didn't do last year. And then the next year we do the same thing and we add to it. So that's a, that's a working document that's 20 years old. Um, there's a lot of information on there. There's a lot of stuff that we don't do every year on there. And when I do give that to kids, it, it usually is kind of a mess because uh, they're overwhelmed with the detail. Um, and frankly, a lot of our coaches, I don't, I don't know that it's all that helpful to a lot of them. Even I think the best practice for them is to, to give it to them as an overview and as a backup document. But, uh, I feel like our best instruction for our coaches have come in our retreat. We do a retreat every year. And then we try to have our lower level coaches coach with us at a camp, uh, so that they have a hands-on experience at our camp and they're doing it with us, um, before they go work with their kids. But, um, it, now, I say that this year we created a, a private website for our kids to go to. Um, a lot of it is more about just trying to find things to engage them with right now. And this time that we're all at home and we're away from things. I, I know I've got some football junkies uh, and I want those football junkies to have something to occupy their mind. It's not even really about how much they're gaining, you know, cognitively from it. I, ultimately, I think... I think this year is going to be like kind of, you know, if we play a 2020 season, I have a feeling it's going to be a lot like the 72 season where everybody shows up in the fall and we, we get conditioned the best we can to start with. And we have basic playbooks because that's what we're going to have time for. And we go play ball. 
and, and we get kids to play. And I, and I hope we can provide that for our kids. I hope that, you know, our seniors certainly deserve those opportunities. So I, in my mindset right now, I, anything that we're giving the kids conditioning wise or uh, uh, playbook wise, I'm not sure if it's really giving us an advantage at all or creating a disadvantage if we don't give them. I think it's just more about keeping kids engaged and active and mentally sharp and, and together and, and just caring about people in society is more of my mindset than necessarily any growth that we did. Okay. Um, in relation to the double wing, how much in-season lifting do you do? Um, yeah. Obviously, with with this offense, I mean, lifting is a very important aspect in terms of physical strength and a variety of other strength and conditioning aspects as well. How, how much in-season lifting do you do during the actual season? You know, I think that, I, number one, I think that's the strength and conditioning component uh, and the double wing is probably not any more or less important than any other offense. I, it, I, I think a lot of the, the double wing guys get this uh, mindset that it's like priority, the priority is higher. And I think that's more because a lot of double wing guys are really good strength guys. I mean, at least in my circles of, of guys that I've, I've met with that run this system, a lot of us started out in strength and conditioning or had a large strength and conditioning background and large passion for strength and conditioning. I know I did. And then this offense kind of naturally tailored to that because our mindset was all built on this developmental uh, thought process. And then when you start coaching the system, the double wing system, it, you're talking a lot about working on kids getting uh, fundamentally better. Your real, your focus is really fundamental oriented versus scheme oriented. Um, and I think a lot. That, I, I think they just kind of play together as far as the type of person uh, that you you may have that first installs this offense. With that said, I I think you know when you're looking at great spread teams or you're looking at great veer teams or you know great wing T teams, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're great because they've got great strength and conditioning programs. And uh, I think that's a parallel amongst great programs. I don't think that's just a parallel of double wing teams. But uh, in season, we're there twice a week. Uh, right now, the majority of our kids have lifting class, so they'll, they'll lift during their school day. Uh, RJ Rios is our current strength coach and does a great job with them in there. Uh, after school, in the, in the entire school year, and this is something that's kind of unique, we lift two days a week, uh, basically from November till June. We, we don't go to a three-day week program until the summer. And the reason that is, is I always felt personally that I had my greatest gains when I was on a four-day week program. I'd go upper, lower, upper, lower. I always felt that because it's a couple of things. Number one, mentally, I could handle it. Once I got started getting into five, six, seven, eight programs, uh, I would get, I would have those days that it was a fight to get in there because of the daily schedule or whatnot. Uh, four days, I could always seemingly find four days to get to the gym for a little bit. Number two is I was hitting my upper hard and my lower hard every other day, and, and then I would have the recovery day and then I'd be able to get after again. Um, what we decided was if you're on a four day program or a two day program, it's essentially the same, just a two day program to total body. Uh, we've always had issues getting good numbers on Fridays because on Friday after school, everyone wanted to go home or go do whatever they were doing for the weekend. Um, so probably about 10 years ago, we decided we weren't going to have Friday lifts anymore. And we started going uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays. And then at some point in that time, we, we realized, if we're doing an upper on Monday and a lower on Tuesday and a total body on Thursday, why not just have two total body lifts and go Monday and Wednesday? And to be honest, our strength gains have been better since going to a two-day program than they ever were on a three-day program. What do you think is probably the most under-coached thing in the double wing? Um, I mean, and, I, and I know that's a really broad question. Yeah. I mean, that's being very broad with it. Um, you could take that in a lot of directions. Um, hell, you could. Let me let me attack it this way. I think that one of the things that us as double wing coaches have to protect against is uh, a mindset that all that matters is power. Um, I I, th I think typically I, typically at least in the initial install, you get so much better as a program when you first put this offense in. Oftentimes, because of the power play, because you can you can go forward. And you can knock some people backwards and you can move the chain. So, you know, a lot of teams are putting this offense in because they haven't had success. And uh, when they first put it in, they have immediate success because maybe maybe they were punting, you know, five or six times a game. And now all of a sudden they're punting two times a game and, and it's significant improvement. 
and then I think sometimes there's this thought process that, oh, we just got to get better at power. We just got to get better at power. We just got to get better at power. And that focus and emphasis becomes everything surrounding around power. And the reality is your kids want to become better football players. So your, your kids aren't worried about just hammering their head against the wall, uh, trying to run power better. They, if they're a quarterback, they want to develop as a passer and as a runner and as a guy who understands the overall scheme and, and un- understands the total game. And your ends want to become great ball catchers and they want to be good blockers. And they, So I think that is probably the major concept when, I, when thinking about us guys, us guys who run this offense is our focus has to be on the development of players and development on their skills that they want to, to become great at rather than, uh, you know, maybe our desire or simplistic approach of a, we just got to get better at power. Um, and I think that's a transition that I know I went through as a coach. I remember as a, as a young coach thinking, man, if I can get this so perfect where they where we're like robots, nobody will ever stop us. And although that's true, it's not realistic because the reality is they're, they're not robots. They're human beings that want, have their own desires and passions and goals and they have goals in this game afterwards. And I know that there was a significant change for me as a coach when I started really spending a lot of time trying to figure out what they wanted out of the game rather than what I wanted out of them. What did they want out of the game? What did they want out of this experience? And how could I embrace what they wanted within our team goals? And uh, I, we, had a, we had a big change uh, from a program standpoint and from a developmental standpoint. And we've had a lot more guys want to play college football and go on and play for four years and things like that since we made that change philosophically. We still had success both ways, but there's been a big change. And I think the fulfillment of the experience that our kids have had, and it, let's face it, that matters a lot more than anything else. A couple questions just so we start wrapping up. I want to go back to practice real quick. Do you, I'm because I'm, my experience when when we go, we we could never predict necessarily what front we were going to get. So during yep. the week, we always practice five and six man fronts. Do you do, yep. I mean, I know you see a lot of the same opponents. You've been doing this for a long time now, so you probably get a lot of the same looks. But is that still a philosophy for you? Where in practice we'll show a variety of five, six, seven man fronts. Yeah. Throughout so the week? that's a great question, and, and so ultimately, <laughs> you're right. And then I think there's a different different page to this too. So uh, basically, that four four six two look and a five two seven two look, most double tight double wing teams see the most of. And I think I think that's probably pretty universal. Uh, one of the things that we identified was that that we felt like that five two seven two scheme was probably the the most common one we eventually we saw when we stayed at a place for a period of time. And I think a lot of it was the, I think it was the guy's name was Dick, Dick Bruick out of, uh, um, Oh, he was in that Bloomington area where, uh, Don Markham was. So Markham put this in, in Bloomingham and there was a guy named Dick. I think his name was Dick Bruick that, uh, ran a seven, two concept against them, ran it pretty successfully, put it on the internet, uh, you know, how to stop the double wing. And I know it was mimicked a lot and it, it was a very, very sound scheme. We felt like if our wing backs could block the overhang defenders, uh, we, we could move the ball very, very effectively against that look. However, if their overhang defenders caused our wing back issues, then it was very, very sticky, very difficult to move the ball on. And it was going to be a fight to score 14 or 21 points in those types of cons and those types of games. Uh, when we started going into a multi-formational system, when we started bumping in things, and, and really that that for that defensive front was was the impetus for it. That was why we made that change. When we started bouncing formations, uh, defenses got a lot more static for us. I think it's twofold. Number one, if we're going to give eight, ten formational looks, probably on the scouting report, closer to sixteen to twenty formational looks uh the defense has to have some hard rules and those hard rules are going to be more aligned to what they run week to week uh or else they're going to be their kids are going to be confused so that's one piece but i think the other piece to it is a lot of the odd front stuff that we see uh we have some ways that we can take advantage of it pretty quickly and pretty easily um and, and because of that uh typically we see more even fronts 
and which again puts a lot of people in that four four six two look. Uh, and, and again, they may be an odd front team that walks off a guy and bumps their front, or they may do it in different structures. But in the end, what we're seeing pretty much one common defense now, uh, week in and week out. And, I th- and, it, and it, it makes sense to me with as far as the different looks we're giving, the different structures we're look, giving. And frankly, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we've run so much empty over the last couple of years is because that puts a lot of, lot of pressure on an eight-man front, eight-man box. In terms of form, going back to formations, because like formations is one of my big things. One of the things that I truly enjoy about this offense is ability about be multi formational, and and to run the ball so well. Um, do you have a plan every week on how many formations you want to use a game? Is there? Do you kind of just leave everything with how you do it? Actually, actually, let me go this way. How many, How do you structure your formations? Is it tags or is it? formation names and that's and we yeah, can kind so of explain off that we, yeah and I, i'll give you kind of the structure of how we install them as well so we start out with double tight double wing okay and the first day of practice we have double tight double wing in and we have over under it those go in right from the get-go the reason that is is we flip our tackle on, on over under which over under is unbalanced for us okay uh so it'd be unbalanced with a split end still double wing formation we flip the tackle over. So now that creates some changes in rules for that tackle uh, that's on the outside aligned in the tight end position. And for the tight end who's on the nub side or the weak side of the formation, he's kind of got some of the tackle rules and the other boys has some of the tight end rules. So by doing that on day one, where we only have wedge and power in uh, schematically, they're learning those base rules from both of those alignments. Um, so that, that's day one stuff. After that, um, we'll put up, up right end, up left, which is just putting the wing on the line of scrimmage. That's significant. Um, and by the way, over and under, in our opinion, is the number one complementary formation that all double wing teams should be running. Um, wing on is another formation that all double wing teams should be running. That is significant because if you do play teams that are going to create issues with their play side uh, linebacker and his insert being so fast and physical, you can't get to him. You've got to be able to walk your line of, your, your wing up on the line of scrimmage. And it may be to trap because you may tra- end up trapping that insert player. So you have to be able to give that illusion of, of we're walking up, we're running power here, even if you're running schemes underneath it or countering back away from our giving up the looks. Um, Then we're going to put in the tight alignment. So the next, and this is the next major instructional thing. So a tight alignment for us is anytime the tight end is aligned outside the wing. So for us, we would initially do it out of over under because we have that formation in. So we'd go over tight. So the the tight end would just be outside the wing and we'd be an unbalanced set. Uh, The next thing we do after that is offset the fullback. There's a lot of reasons we offset the fullback. Some is to create an influence of the defense some of it is to create an extra hat in, in certain schemes. Uh, then we introduce flex. Flex is always introduced when we teach pop. They go in the same day. Uh, we don't run a ton of flex. It's not a formation we run a lot of, um, but there are some purposes that we run it to. So, for example, we play a 4-3 defense. Uh, we see a ton of Michigan State 4-3 up here. Uh, running flex and having your, your number one run an outside vertical gets that kid to run, excuse me, it gets that kid to run off because of the, the base philosophy that that defense has. And then when we've had a fullback that's a, a decent runner, which typically we do because we do start our kind of our, our personnel with our fullback position, uh, attacking the flat with the will linebacker being conscious of, of his wing back. He's got to see his wing back was motioning away. And then his eyes typically go to the far wing back. It makes it a very, very difficult coverage in the flat on waggle to that fullback. So that's, that's a concept that we run when we see four or three teams a lot, that type of thing. And then we'll go tight, which takes the tight ends right outside of it. And then we start introducing our empty stuff and all the empty stuff is, is compliments to all the regular formations. So we would word it like this. Uh, we were over tight. So we're over formation, unbalanced to the right, and tight, meaning the tight ends aligned outside the wing. And then if we want to go empty, we want to move our fullback to the right, it would be red. So it'd be over tight red for us. Okay. If we wanted to go to the left, we'd call it blue. So it'd be over tight blue for us. 
Um, basically, wing back alignments, we have up right, up left, which puts the wing on the line of scrimmage. Uh, we have tray or deuce where the uh, wing on the left side on tray would go to the right side and would split out to go into a trips formation. Deuce is just the opposite of that going to the left. Um, and then all, fullbacks can offset or they can go red and blue. And then on line of scrimmage, we have double wing, we have tight, we have over, uh, over tight, obviously, and then flex. So once you start combining all of those together, uh, and then of course we have stack I that will line up in two. Once you start mixing those, there's quite a few different possibilities uh, of getting in. And once the kids know what their purpose is in each of those, it doesn't really matter if you mix them or not. As we as this offense continues to evolve, what do you kind of foresee as the kind of the next forms of evolution? I mean, I know you've talked a lot formationally. I know there's obvious there's obviously gun stuff that can be done with it. Like what what do you envision kind of like next, either evolutions for this offense or ways that people will attack this offense that will cause this offense to evolve? Yeah, you know, it's a great question because it has a lot. I mean, you look at the, the, the gun double wing stuff, which it obviously has a lot of single wing principles to it. I mean, um, I, I know that oftentimes when gun double wing comes up, the first response you get is no, that's single wing. Um, and, and it is in a lot of ways, but there are some there are some differences there. We play a St. Creeks, a team in our league who does a great job with single wing offense. Um, and, and it's very different from, you know, what Murph's done with the shotgun double wing and, and what a lot of the other great coach double wing coaches have evolved out there. Uh, we, we've messed with that a little bit. And our concern was we lost two folds of our three fold principles. So uh, in the double wing, you know, our three fold principle was, was all about uh, creating vertical movement, running power, being able to run speed sweep and be able to have a great play action game off of it. When we got into the shotgun double wing stuff, uh, we felt like the power game was even better. We really did. We felt like the ability to play more vertical and downhill, uh, the guard being able to pull with a little more depth. We thought all of those components were actually better in the shotgun than they were uh, under center for us. Uh, we felt like we lost the entire fullback game, though, obviously with them being an up back rather than uh, straight behind the center. And we felt the play action game was not nearly as good or effective uh, because you didn't have the action and mesh that you did when you were under center. And then you lost your speed sweep game, essentially. And you could run your little pitch play or whatnot, but it just, it wasn't the same. Uh, so I guess that to me, that would be the next evolution is how, uh, how can you play this system within some type of gun format, which I think would be, you know, kids would be finding fulfilling in today's culture of everyone running guns, single wing football. I mean, you look at the colleges, that's what they're doing. Uh, so how can we dress her up a little bit to have that look while not losing speed tweet game, while not losing play action and still having the same effective power scheme? So if I had that answer, I'd give it to you. Uh, I don't, <laughs> but I do think that like the, the next steps of our scheme, uh, that's where it lies. Uh, and hopefully there's somebody out there with a pen who's a lot smarter than me who's drawing that up right now so I can go copy him later. <laughs> And I got one last question for you because I, I thought about this. With all your formational stuff, how much like tight end screen or like split out screen stuff do you run? Do you, I mean, as a compliment uh, to your offense? Yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy because that's like, that was like goal one, goal one for us in uh, the 2020 offseason. We haven't been a very good screen team. Um, Dan Terryberry was a semifinalist this year at Onsta High School. And a great friend of mine right up the road. He's been running this offense since 97. So he's been doing it for a few years. Had a fantastic screen game this year. Uh, great tight end screen package, great wingback screen package, a nice fullback screen package. Uh, he did he did some really, really nice stuff with the screen package. So we've been actually meeting with him quite a bit, trying to trying to get better at that element. Uh, it, it's an area that we haven't been very good at. We know we have to focus time on it. We're talking about making that another group drill where we do screens every day for a period. Um, yeah, you know, I think, I think that's half of our problem is that we got to emphasize it if we want to be good at it, but we had, we haven't been, we've been a terrible screen team. Um, can it be done? Absolutely. I, I watched Dan do it this year and watched how it had a huge impact on his program. But, um, to be real honest, it's something that we've, we've, uh, we've failed at and need improvement. Okay. 
And then uh, I'll, I'll leave the floor to you. Is there anything that you want to comment on as we wrap up on the double wing, on football in general? Um, just any thoughts you want to relay? Yeah, I mean, I guess for the, the double wing guys out there that are listening, uh, you know, thanks for thanks for listening. If you guys need anything, uh, my email is mensing at whiteford.k12.mi.us. Um, I'm open for any any conversation with regards to the offense. Uh, I think it's a great offense. I think it's a great system for kids. I think we as double wing coaches have to continue to focus on investing in our kids rather than uh, rather than trying to have them uh, all do things perfectly for us, us finding out what they're looking for in their experience and invest in it. Um, so to you, Nick, I appreciate the work you're doing with this uh, YouTube uh, website here and, and getting information out to coaches. Uh, it's a, a gift of your time. And uh, I think anything that helps our game grow and expand and builds fellowship amongst coaches is a good thing. So Nick, I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate that coach. 